Our Bible reading tonight is taken from Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 to 22. Have your Bibles with you to follow through as we read, as I read. Exodus 25, verses 1 to 22. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from me, from each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver and bronze. Blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. Goat hair, ram ram skins dyed, red and hides of sea cows. Acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. And onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold moulding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. Make an atonement cover of pure gold two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. There, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. This is God's word. Thanks, Stephen. Well, as has been mentioned a few times, my name is Matt Kennedy. I'm one of the pastors at Chatswood Baptist Church. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ian uh, sent me an email. It was a rather desperate sounding email asking whether I might be able to um, preach uh, either morning or evening on this day. Uh, I may well have been seventh, you know, on the list of people, who knows. Um, But you've got me. uh, And so hopefully we can um, reflect on that uh, passage together tonight. Now, I want to begin by asking about camping. Some of us love camping, some of us hate camping. (laughs) Uh, Hands up if you're in the love camping category. Yep, so it's proving my point, that's not everyone. Some of us love camping, some of us hate camping. Uh, We've just had two weeks caravanning around Tasmania. Um, This is, you can see a photo there, it's my kids. uh, George in the middle, Grace and Benji. Uh, It was very exciting for them. Uh, to be caravanning around Tasmania. It's a kind of camping. Uh, and it, it was pretty intense. Um, lots of packing up, moving, driving, um, reversing into awkward spots and so on. But it was an amazing experience. Uh, a really good experience overall. Our previous camping trip, however, proper camping, uh, it was in January last year, just two nights on the central coast. It was a bit of a nightmare, quite different. So this is our, our tent set up there. Uh, Now, firstly, the problem was we thought we were going to die in the heat. Uh, I don't know if you can remember a year ago, there was a heat wave around Australia Day. It was the worst time to be camping. It was was, uh, really unpleasant. Uh, But then a cool change came through, but that kind of wasn't any better. Uh, It came through with massive gusty winds until we're up in the middle of the night pulling down tent poles and tarpaulins because they're going to fly off and stab someone. Uh, in the middle of the night and all around us gazebos are being picked up and thrown around Uh, so that that wasn't heaps of fun. Um, To be honest we we were glad just to get home. Uh, We have had good experiences though camping and I'm sure some of you have had great experiences camping. So 
But whether or not our experiences of camping are wonderful memories of peace and tranquility or nightmares of heat stroke and gale force winds, either way, I, I want to say tonight that camping with God is the best. It's, it's really what life is all about. Now, I don't mean literally going camping yourself with a tent and all the rest and then um, taking a lot of time to read the Bible and pray and be with God, camping with God like that. Now, I'm sure that could be wonderful. That, that could be a great thing to do. But I mean God literally camping with you uh, in his own tent. So that's basically what the passage from Exodus we read earlier is all about. Now, tonight, I want to take you guys on a bit of a tour through uh, chapters 25 to 27 of the book of Exodus. Ian said I could preach on whatever I want, so there we go. Uh, and, and we're going to use that as a window to really look into the, the whole last third of the book of Exodus. Uh, now, it's a part of the Bible that you probably haven't read a lot of. In Sunday school, we tend to focus on Moses and the burning bush and the, the ten plagues and the, you know, the great rescue, the, the escape through the water and then Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments, and then we move on to something else. But the Ten Commandments, that's in chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. Exodus has 40 chapters. There's a lot more to come. Uh, and whilst there's, there, there's other details, and there's a pretty significant moment with a golden calf, which you've probably heard about, uh, the final third of the book, chapters 25 to 40, they all revolve around the building of this tent, the tabernacle. Uh, for God to camp with his people, uh, to, to go with them in their travels and, and into the land that he's promised them. Uh, and I want to talk to you tonight about those instructions. Now, I, I get that that's a bit of a random thing uh, to preach on. I don't know what you have been preaching on recently. Uh, probably not instructions about the tabernacle. Uh, and I, I appreciate that the instructions themselves can seem overly detailed and, and frankly, boring to us. So there is a lot of detail chapter after chapter of detailed instructions from God on what they were to build with dimensions, shapes and materials. And then if you can believe it, the detail, not just the big idea, but the detail is repeated in the final five chapters of the book of Exodus as the narrator describes the actual building process. Uh, I recently found out um, that the guy who translated the book of Exodus uh, into the Greek, into the Septuagint, um, over 2,000 years ago, when he got to those last final five chapters, he just wrote, and Moses did as God commanded. <laughs> that was his shorthand of those five chapters. Very understandable approach, I think. Now, if we're honest, these instructions and, and descriptions of the building of the tabernacle and everything associated with it, if, if we're reading through it on our own, frankly, it can feel like some of the most boring verses in the Bible. It, it, it's okay to admit that. But at the same time, when we appreciate the significance of what's being commanded and why, I think they're some of the most profound and exciting verses in the story of Exodus and really the whole Bible so far. See, the building of the tabernacle, it's actually what the book of Exodus has been building up to. See, this tent, it's not a side detail or like an appendix, uh, you know, one of those boring appendixes at the end, it wasn't interesting enough to put in the middle, so you just put it at the end. No, no, it's the main event. It's hugely significant for Israel and for us because in a sense this tent is what we were created and redeemed for. The tabernacle is the heart of Exodus and it points to the heart of the whole story of the Bible. Now that might sound like a bit of an exaggeration to try to get you excited about some not very exciting verses in the Bible but it's true. See the, the tabernacle it's it's all about recreating the Garden of Eden and it points forward to God's final plans to recreate the whole world to be a perfect dwelling place for God and humanity together. Uh, the author of the classic series, The Lord of the Rings, um, hopefully some people have, have read or at least watched the movies here, heard about it. Uh, the, the author, J.R.R. Tolkien, was writing a letter to his son, Christopher, and discussing uh, his son's reaction to something painful that he'd experienced. And we have this beautiful quote from his letter uh, up on the screen. We all long for Eden and we're constantly glimpsing it. Our whole nature at its best and least corrupted, its gentlest and most human, is still soaked with a sense of exile, exile from the garden. That's true, isn't it? Even during our greatest moments, our, our most Instagrammable moments in life and the times when 
when we feel like we, we are acting in, in genuinely good and loving ways, even at these times, there's a deep understanding that things aren't quite right. Our whole nature is soaked with a sense of exile from the garden, from the life that we know we were created for. As Tolkien says, we all long for Eden and, and throughout our days in, in the highs and the lows, we're catching glimpses of it. Sometimes reflections of it in the beauty of this world and the wonderful, amazing experiences of life in this world, but sometimes it's sharp reminders that we are far from it in the pain and the frustration of this world. So our, our personal stories and our communal stories are, in a sense, revolve around this quest to find a way back to the Garden of Eden, uh, to seek and find the peace and the meaning and the satisfaction that we know we were created for. But it's the story of the Bible too. And often uh, you might have heard it spoken of as the story of the kingdom of God. Uh, but it's essentially the same story. It's the story of God creating and redeeming a people to dwell in his presence, to live in his holy place, to enjoy his holy rest. That's the story of the Bible from beginning to end. And that is what the tabernacle is really all about. So first of all, we're going to uh, kind of skim through but get a clear picture of what God was instructing them to build through these chapters in Exodus. Uh, and then we'll explore why he wants them to build it, uh, and this way in particular, and, and how that points us to this bigger picture that I've just been painting. Uh, so at the beginning of chapter 25, uh, that was read out for us, we, we can see that God tells Moses to tell the Israelites to bring free will offerings of all sorts of building materials. Um, precious metals, fabrics, gemstones and oils and spices, uh, as well as more common materials like animal skins and wood. Uh, and God goes on to explain uh, in verse 8, the Israelites were to use all these things to make a sanctuary for the Lord so that he might dwell amongst them. Now, a sanctuary uh, literally means a holy place, uh, which is what is required for a holy God to take up residence. Uh, and, and so that's what this is all about. That's the big idea. Uh, God, a holy dwelling place for God amongst his people. And we'll, we'll come back to that. But then before God goes on to tell them exactly uh, what they need to construct, he makes the point. You must make it according to all that I show you. So the, the pattern of the tabernacle as well as the pattern of all its furnishings. It's God's tabernacle according to God's design. The Israelites, they can't just make whatever seems like a good idea to them for somewhere for God to live. Uh, their access to God comes on God's terms, not theirs. Okay, so, so diving into what God instructions, instructs them to build, first of all, he says they need to build an ark, basically a hollow box. We should have an image up on the screen. I can't, oh yeah, it's there. I just can't see it there. So I'll just assume it's all good. Uh, basically, a hollow box uh, built out of acacia wood and covered in gold. Uh, it was to have rings and poles so that it could be moved around uh, and so that once it was set up, they, they didn't actually need to touch the ark itself. And Moses was to put the stone tablets uh, that God was giving to him with the Ten Commandments inscribed on them inside the ark. Uh, and God then described a special cover for the ark, uh, described as a mercy seat, uh, made out of pure gold with two cherubim uh, hammered out of the same piece of gold facing each other on top of the cover. Uh, now, I'm just conscious, in the, the verses that I'll show up on the screen, they're from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, I'm not 100% sure we'll be reading the NIV, early NIV. Both great translations, but just the verses that I'll show and the, and the language that I'll use is from the Christian Standard Bible. Um, so, God, uh, we've got these two cherubim hammered out of um, the same piece of gold facing each other on top of this cover. Now, cherubim there, uh, winged angelic creatures that seem to, to represent or to protect or cover over the holiness of God. Now this ark, it gets placed at the heart of the tabernacle and it represents the place where God will be enthroned amongst his people and meet with them. And so God explains to Moses, I will meet with you there above the mercy seat, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. So that's the, the ark, the mercy seat, uh, at the heart of the tabernacle. And then God tells them to construct a table. Again, it's out of wood, uh, then covered in gold all over, and it also has rings and gold-plated wooden poles uh, for transporting it. 
Uh, there are plates and cups and pitchers and bowls, all made from pure gold for drink offerings. And this uh, special bread, the bread of the presence, is to be placed on this table as an offering to God. Next, God instruction, instructs them to make a lampstand out of pure hammered gold. Uh, everything from one big piece of gold. It's actually about 37 kilograms of gold, one solid piece. Uh, so it's got these seven lamps uh, in total, one on the main shaft, three branches coming out each side. Uh, and God explains that, that the shaft and the branches, they ought to have these, these little cups shaped like almond blossoms formed into them, all out of one big piece of gold. Next we get to chapter 26, and that whole chapter describes the tabernacle itself, a large, elaborate tent with two sections to hold these items. Now you can read the detail later if you want to, um, but if you do, I'd recommend doing so whilst referring to a diagram like this. This is from the ESV Study Bible. Uh, it's, I think, find it quite helpful. When you just read through the detail, it all just kind of swims around in your head and it's hard to make a lot of sense of it. Now, basically, it was a whole bunch of curtains made from finely spun linen with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. And then the curtains are joined together with gold clasps hung on large wooden supports, which are um, spaced less than a meter apart and covered in gold. And then these supports were then connected with gold-plated wooden beams fed through gold rings. Uh, and then the whole tent was covered in a number of layers of cloth and animal skins to protect it from the weather. And inside the tabernacle, there was another division, another row of gold-covered supports with a special curtain hung across it, uh, dividing the, the holy place, um, the main two-thirds of the tabernacle, from the most holy place in the back third of the tent. God explains from verse 31, you're to make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely spun linen with a design of cherubim worked into it. Hang it on four gold-plated pillars of acacia wood that have gold hooks and that stand on four silver bases. Hang the curtain under the clasps and bring the Ark of the Testimony there behind the curtain so the curtain will make a separation for you between the holy place and the most holy place. Put the mercy seat on the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. Place the table outside the curtain and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle, uh, opposite the table, put the table on the north side. So that's the sanctuary, the, the tabernacle itself, this holy house uh, with the most holy place within it and, and the special items that, that, um, that related to God's holy presence inside it. Uh, then in, in chapter 27, God details the construction of the things outside of the tabernacle. Firstly, God tells them to construct an altar of acacia wood overlaid with bronze. Uh, it has to be made out of um, panels, so it's hollow inside with grates, uh, and it would be used for making burnt offerings to God. Like the table and the ark, it would have rings and poles for carrying. And then finally, they were to make a courtyard for the tabernacle. There's a large boundary of supports and curtains around the tabernacle, creating a kind of buffer between uh, the sanctuary and the Israelite camp, uh, as well as providing space for the altar and the burnt offerings. So this whole courtyard was to be uh, 150 feet by 75 feet, which created an area basically the size of a quarter acre block of land, about a thousand square meters. Uh, the tabernacle itself was placed in the western half of it and that was about 13 metres long and four and a half metres wide and high. So that's what God commanded them to construct. Uh, and that even that summary detail is not super exciting to us to kind of, you know, step through uh, exactly what's there. Um, you can read in greater detail if you wish. Uh, and there's more to come in chapters 28 to 30, particularly regarding the, the clothing and the implements uh, for the priests in their service, but we've covered the main, um, main structure and furnishings, and tonight I really just want to focus on the tabernacle itself. So it's basically a big three-part tent and courtyard with furnishings for worshipping God. And although it would have been a, a bit of a job, it wasn't like one of those pop-up, instant pop-up tents, um, it could be taken down and moved and set up again. That was, that was the whole point. It was a tent for God to travel and camp with his people. And so now we want to consider why God wanted this sanctuary according to this pattern that he was giving them. I've already pointed out how God told Moses to make sure that everything was constructed according to the pattern that he was giving them. 
uh, and in a couple of other places, the command is repeated, that to make it just as it was shown to you on the mountain. So why does God want all these things constructed in this way? Well, firstly, the design and the materials used highlight the holiness of God and his identity as the sovereign ruler of Israel. There is a lot of precious metals and fabrics used through the tabernacle. The, the, the gold and the purple fabrics in particular point to the royalty of God as their king. This would be a very expensive tent. Uh, but secondly, as you read through the instructions, it's clear that, that as you move from the outer courtyard through the holy place to the most holy place, um, where God is enthroned above the ark, the materials become more costly, more precious. You move from bronze and silver to more and more gold as you come towards the holy of holies. See, ultimately, this is designed to emphasize the, the holiness of God, their king and their redeemer. But secondly, um, there are some clear allusions in this tabernacle design and furnishings to the Garden of Eden. Now, from here on, we're going to dive into a, a little bit of the detail, uh, and you might need your, your thinking caps on and, and follow along for the ride, but I think it's worth it. Now, one of the main connections to the Garden of Eden is the presence of the cherubim, the, the winged angelic creatures that were to be woven into the, the curtain fabric and hammered into the mercy seat on top of the ark. Now, the only time we hear of cherubim in the Bible before this passage is in Genesis chapter 3, after God basically kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. Uh, there, in chapter 3, we read, he drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. In the presence of the cherubim, it alerts us to the fact that God's people are now being invited with certain conditions, in a, in a, to a certain extent, back into the presence of God. But that verse, Genesis 3.24, it also draws attention to two other connections as well. Firstly, just as the entrance that was guarded by the cherubim was to the east of the garden, so the most holy place and the holy place and the courtyard, they all opened to the east. Uh, it's subtle, reading it in uh, Exodus 25 to 27, but the instructions clearly mark out the back wall of the tabernacle as the western side. It opens to the east. But then secondly, there's the tree of life. Uh, the golden lampstand providing light in the holy place, it's designed with almond buds and petals all over it to give the appearance of a tree with many branches. And near the lampstand is the table with the bread of presence. Uh, and together these things uh, point to the life-giving presence of God. And these allusions to the Garden of Eden, they're, they're strengthened later when King Solomon builds the temple as a, as a stationary, solid version of the tabernacle. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 6, we read that the doors and the walls of the temple, they were covered with carvings of cherubim and palm trees and flower blossoms. Uh, that the whole thing was basically a shiny golden tribute to the Garden of Eden. And that should not be surprising to us because the Garden of Eden was created to be a holy dwelling place of God and man together. In fact, the connections between the, the temple and the tabernacle and the Garden of Eden, they, they help us understand that the garden itself was a temple of God. It was his holy dwelling place created for human beings to enjoy life in his presence. So the tabernacle, it, it's like a recreation of Eden within a fallen world, claiming space and, and making it a holy dwelling place of God amongst his people. Where God had previously banished humanity from the garden, out of his presence, now he provides a place where he will meet with his people. The, the tabernacle, it's described as the tent of meeting in the final verses of chapter 27. And we've seen how God uh, says that he will meet with Moses above the mercy seat in the most holy place to, to speak with him and give uh, commands. Uh, in fact, the presence of the stone tablets in the ark and, and the promise to meet above the ark and to give commands uh, for Israel, it's another allusion to the Garden of Eden. It, it reminds us of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree represented the law of God, his good and wise rule over his people. 
Uh, being in the life-giving presence of God meant access to God's word, uh, and it involved trust in that word. And life lived in grateful, obedient trust in God's word. It's not burdensome or a prison. It's the very essence of peace, as the Bible describes it. it it's the enjoyment of God's rest. You see, there's one more big connection to Genesis 1 and 2 uh, in the Garden of Eden here. Uh, it's the idea of entering into God's rest. And many of you will be aware uh, of the way that the creation account in Genesis 1 is presented as six days of creation leading up to a seventh day of rest. And this pattern, six days of work and then a day of rest, it's presented as the basis for the Sabbath, the, the, the weekly day of rest for the Israelites. Uh, and here in Exodus, when we get to the very end of the instructions for constructing the tabernacle and everything related to the priests of well, as well, um, in the, the second half of chapter 31, we read uh, these words. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you will know that I am the Lord who consecrates you. Observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. The Israelites must observe the Sabbath, celebrating it throughout their generations as a permanent covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the Israelites, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, do you notice that begins with uh, the phrase, the Lord said to Moses. Now, that seems very common and unremarkable in and of itself, hard to make much of a, a deal about that, except that it just so happens to be the seventh and final time that that phrase is used throughout all the instructions that God gives regarding the building of the tabernacle. So just as the creation account uh, repeats the phrase, and God said, and God said, um, through six days of creation leading up to a seventh day of rest, so there are six sections of instruction uh, given leading up to a seventh instruction here, the command to keep the Sabbath in the honor uh, in honor of god now why is this important why am i drawing your attention to these kind of obscure details what well, highlights what the tabernacle is all about what the presence of god in our midst really means in the end see god's people are being invited to enter into god's rest as they enjoy life in his holy presence once again now enjoying god's rest it doesn't mean doing nothing uh, true, the symbolic ritual of the Sabbath involved that discipline of refraining from actual work. But that ritual, it pointed to a bigger reality of enjoying life in God's rest, enjoying life in fellowship with God and in, in submission to his good word, life as it was meant to be. So you can see why these chapters describing the tabernacle are the heart or, or the climax of the story of Exodus, can't you? God is recreating Eden in the midst of his people, uh, culminating in the invitation to enter into his rest, in his presence. This is what he has redeemed them from Egypt for. That's what it's all about. But it's not just allusions back to Eden, to the original garden. It's not just a symbol, symbolic recreation of that first Eden. The tabernacle was appointed to a more ultimate reality. And not just something bigger and better than the tabernacle, but, but even than the original garden of Eden. So the tabernacle and the temple to follow, they were designed to point to a final reality, a new Eden, a new heaven and earth where God dwells with his people, not, not symbolically uh, in a tent, but literally a whole new creation where heaven and earth are actually one and the same. So the tabernacle, it's a signpost in history to God's great future for his creation. In the final chapters of the book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, uh, the Apostle John sees in a new heavens and a new earth presented in the form of a new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God to a renewed earth. And it's clear that this city, this new creation, is a new and final Eden. John is shown the river of, of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street, uh, just like the river that flowed in the original garden, watering all the lands of the earth. And he explains the tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. Now, the, the city itself, not only are there these clear allusions to the Garden of Eden, but there's clear indications that it's, it's a huge temple 
a holy dwelling place for God and man together once again. See, John sees that the whole city is made from pure gold. That should ring a few bells from from what we've read in Exodus. But gold's so pure that it's as clear as glass. And the angel giving John the, the vision, he measures the city and shows, kind of bizarrely at first, when you first read about it, that it's a gigantic cube, equal in height and, and width and, and length. But if you go back to the detail of Exodus chapter 26, um, based on where the, the, the curtain is hung, the uh, sectioning off the most holy place, and the width and the height of the tabernacle, you can work out that the most holy place where God was enthroned above the ark, it was a perfect cube, 15 feet high, wide and long. See, the point is that this whole city coming down, it it is the most holy place. There's no separation anymore, no need for separation. And that's why John explains, I did not see a temple in it, because the Lord God and the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine it because the glory of God illuminates it and the, its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now it's the, the reality that Tolkien was talking about, isn't it? The Eden our hearts catch glimpses of and long for. The future that God promises us and points us to through the tabernacle. Now, not living in a gigantic cube, but living in the life-giving presence of God. It's a reality uh, summed up in these words proclaimed from the throne of God. Look, God's dwelling, literally God's tabernacle, is with humanity, and he will live with them. They'll be his peoples, and God will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes just as we we sung about earlier tonight. Death will be no more, grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Now this is the the rest that we are searching for, life as it was created to be, lived in the presence of God. Augustine of Hippo, the 4th century theologian, he writes in his confessions, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. Now, this is what the tabernacle is revealing and pointing to. That's why God wanted it made uh, in a certain way. That's why these instructions and descriptions of the tabernacle take up a third of the book of Exodus. But the tabernacle, it was also a solemn reminder that they weren't there yet. Uh, The people of God, they didn't actually have personal access to the holy presence of God that they were still waiting to enter into God's rest. Now, in the new creation, as we've seen, there are no divisions. There's no outer court for the people, no holy place just for the priests, no, no most holy place just for the high priest once a year. The whole thing is the most holy place. God is everywhere with everyone. But the tabernacle with its curtains and divisions, it was a powerful testimony to separation between the holiness of God and the people. It was like the, the revelation of God back on Mount Sinai, back in uh, chapter 19. Uh, if you want to go back and, and look at that later, you, you'll notice that there's three divisions. The people could come to the base of the mountain uh, only after they'd consecrated themselves. Uh, and then the priests could go with Moses and Aaron halfway up the mountain, kind of like going into the holy place. And then only Moses could go up to the top of the mountain where God would manifest his awesome presence. Uh, just like in the most holy place. So the, the tabernacle, it continued to proclaim the message of Mount Sinai. Sinful people cannot approach a holy God. And the, the curtain that covered over the most holy place, it declared this loud and clear. Uh, the New Testament writer to the Hebrews explains, the Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. As long as that curtain with its cherubim was hanging there, representing the the cherubim and the flaming sword, um, guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden, as long as that was hanging there, then sinful people could not come into the presence of a holy God. There's a wonderful children's book, uh, The Garden, The Curtain and the Cross. Anyone read, seen this book? Yeah, a few people. It's it's a great book. It's beautiful. It explains this 
message really well. Uh, the message of the tabernacle to God's people was basically, uh, it's wonderful to live with God, but because of your sin, you can't come in. That dual message. God's presence is here, it's wonderful to live with God, but because of your sin, you can't actually come in. But of course, the good news is that everything has changed with Jesus, hasn't it? We can look forward with absolute confidence to the final tabernacle in that new creation. And we can enjoy fellowship with God now by faith because Jesus has already come as the true tabernacle himself. He came as the true dwelling place of God with humanity. He he broke down the barriers between a holy God and and sinful, broken people. John's Gospel opens those well-known, incredible words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It literally says in the Greek that, that the Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Jesus is God camping among us as one of us. And through his death, that old tabernacle with its curtains of divisions, its constant reminders that we weren't there yet, it was torn down and done away with. The blood of Jesus has opened a new and living way through the curtain. And that's why the Apostle Paul, he describes Jesus on the cross as a true and final mercy seat. Uh, The fact that the the cover to the Ark of God, where God would meet with them, would meet with Moses, uh, the fact that that was called a mercy seat, it always testified to and pointed to the fact that God's people could only have access to God in a context of of sacrifice and and mercy and forgiveness. We can only have access to God in the context of mercy. And Jesus, in, in his death on the cross, paying the price for our sin, making it possible for us to be reconciled to God, Jesus hanging on the cross in our place is the ultimate meeting place of God and man, isn't he? In Romans chapter 3, Paul explains, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and they're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, God presented him literally as a mercy seat by his blood through faith. You might be more familiar with translations that say something like God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. But the word used here, it's exactly the same as the word uh, in the Greek translation used in Exodus for the cover of the ark. It's a mercy seat. Jesus is the place where we find atonement. He's the place where we sinners can approach to meet with God. He's, He's the place that we hold out to the world around us to come and meet God. By faith in Jesus, we have access to the Father and we boldly approach the throne of grace. In Jesus, we are welcomed back into the garden and into the promised rest of God. We have now, by faith, what our hearts long for. And just as we finish, I know we've covered a lot of ground, but just as we finish, there's one final thing to appreciate about this big story of God's tabernacle. See, not only did Jesus come as the true tabernacle and through his death and resurrection guarantee the final dwelling place of God with man, but through faith in Jesus and the gift of his spirit, we, followers of Jesus, are now being built into a holy dwelling place of God. In various places in the New Testament, uh, you can... You can read uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, these verses uh, from Ephesians up on the screen uh, in in 1 Corinthians. Uh, In various places, the church is described as the holy dwelling place of God here and now in this world. God takes up residence in us by his spirit, individually and as a community that gathers to, to praise God and to love and serve each other. And what's important to appreciate is that the rest that we long for, that that rest that can only be found in the holy presence of God, this rest is experienced, even if it's just as a foretaste, a a glimpse in a sense. It's experienced amongst God's people here and now in our our life and our worship together. So as the spirit and word of God dwells richly amongst us, as we learn the ways of Jesus, as we live in gratitude to God and with compassion and unity towards each other, all of this is a taste, a real taste of the holy rest of God in his holy dwelling place. 
See, in the gospel of Jesus that we proclaim, we hold out the offer of meeting God and satisfying our searching hearts in his holy rest. And as we live out the gospel, we provide a tangible glimpse of living in the glorious presence of God. Let's pray and give thanks for that. Lord God, we, we thank you for your commitment to dwelling amongst us to the point of even taking on flesh and becoming one of us, uh, for sacrificing the life of your own son so that we might be reconciled and welcomed back into your presence. We thank you for everything that, uh, that the tabernacle points to and reminds us of, and we pray that you'll give us a deep and profound appreciation for what we have in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.